presidential coverage here on SNY as we welcome you inside our New York City studios. I'm Gary Apple, that man right there. Our SNY MLB insider, Andy Martino, Anthony Record, the former Met, going to join us in just a little bit as the Mets are getting set to introduce Buck Showalter as the 24th manager in the history of the organization. We're going to get you out to the uh, Zoom new news conference coming up just a little bit. We will hear from Buck Showalter. We'll hear from Sandy Alderson, Billy Epler as well. But before we get there, Andy, how did this come to fruition? Why was it a foregone conclusion pretty much pretty that much Buck was. Showalter was going to get this job? Well, quite frankly, Steve Cohen spent a lot of money on this roster uh, over a very short period of time before the lockout. And with that money, uh, and it's not just about the money, it's about the ambition to win. So with that money comes the expectations. Preceding that money came the ambition. Uh, what you have here is a picture of a Mets team that really, really, really wants to win now. Cohen laid it out at his introductory news conference a little bit more than a year ago, saying that he hoped in three to five years the team could win a championship. So what they really felt that they needed was experience. They needed gravitas. They needed someone who could really plug and play and step right in as an experienced manager, Gary, and, and know what he was doing to take a team that was here last year. They want to be here right away. So it was like Buck Showalter was the guy to get him there quickly, they felt. This is an organization that really has, I think, a pretty good mix right now of veterans mm -hmm. and some younger players and some younger players with some experience now. How important was it to get a guy like Buck Showalter who can run a clubhouse and can do so so successfully and do so in a manner that can lead to championship baseball? Again, he's never won a world championship, but he has improved every team that he has managed, and he has taken three of those four teams to the postseason. Well, certainly the Mets felt that last year they had a good manager in Luis Rojas, and yep. a very promising one, but they felt, especially after some things that happened late in the season, that they needed a little bit more accountability in the clubhouse. They needed somebody who could take some of those younger, homegrown players and just sculpt them a little bit more aggressively into people who could be accountable in the right way and maybe just a little bit more on point uh, so they feel that Buck is that guy. All right, so let's hear from Buck Show, Wal uh, Show Walter right now as we take you to today's news conference. We will begin today. Uh, I'll be turning it over to Mets president, Sandy Alderson. Sandy. Thanks, Harold. Um, <clears throat> Welcome everyone who's uh, on the call. We appreciate you being here and uh, happy holidays over the course of the next uh, week or so. Uh, <clears throat> very pleased today to uh, welcome and formally introduce the next manager of the New York Mets, Buck Showalter. And to uh, also um, uh, introduce as part as, as a new member of the Mets family, uh, Buck's wife, Angela. Uh, <clears throat> We're very happy that uh, Buck is coming back to New York, uh, a place where he started his baseball and managerial careers and where he's had a tremendous amount of experience and uh, familiarity with uh, all of you and uh, New York fandom. Uh, I've known Buck for a long time. You all know him as a three-time American League Manager of the Year, uh, a very successful manager in a variety of different places and circumstances, including an expansion franchise in Arizona. Uh, Buck is going to be a great addition for us, uh, a great addition to what already has been added to the Mets organization over the last part of 2021. And we're really looking forward to the 22 season. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Billy, um, but uh, Buck and Angela, welcome to the Mets. Good afternoon. Uh, you know, thanks, Sandy. Um, I'll just uh, have a few words here. Um, you know, we starting starting this interview process uh, a few weeks back. Uh, we, we sought to look at, at a variety of candidates from from various backgrounds and uh, and experience levels. Um, we looked at a number of criteria, you know, spanning from from culture and connectivity with with players and staff to you know, to embracing new practices in, in both player performance and in, in analytics. Um, we wanted to assess how the candidates problem solved, uh, how they communicated, and, and, and most importantly, how they would shape a, a culture with, with high operational standards. So while, the, while the candidates that we, that we talked to clearly made this a, a tough decision, um, and, and frankly, I feel good about the, the future of, of on-field baseball leadership, 
uh, it was it was Buck's ability to connect uh, to a wide range of people, uh, his his drive to compete, his curiosity blended with his experience, uh, and his overall adaptability uh, that that led us to to naming him manager of the the New York Mets. So with that said, um, I would like to uh, to introduce Buck Showalter as our manager, uh, and Harold, uh, the call is yours. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Billy. Thank you, Sandy. Buck, before you make your uh, remarks, I think there's a jersey there. If I would, if you wouldn't mind, you and uh, and Andrew each holding up a side uh, of that. Hey, Harold, nice going. You got it here in one day. You're good. <laughs> Nothing like a, a virtual photo opportunity. <laughs> thank you, Buck. I believe you have the hat there. If I can yeah. ask you to to don the cap and then uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I'll let you make some uh, some remarks and then we'll go to uh, questions. Gonna mess up what hair I've got left. God bless you. Hey, thanks to everybody. Um, you know, it's a great honor to be here today um, with Angela and, um, you know, just a heartfelt thank you uh, to Steve and Sandy and of course, Billy uh, and Alex too. She, everybody, the Mets are very precious to them. Uh, the fans, uh, they're precious to me. The things, it's a, it's a great charge to keep that, that we have ahead of us. And uh, I just want everybody to know that uh, uh, it's gonna be a priority you know, from day one to put a product out there that everybody can be proud of. You know, there's going to be people when we're on the West Coast uh, staying up to one or two o'clock in the morning to see how the Mets did or do. And, you know, I just want everybody to embrace that responsibility and uh, uh, very excited about the uh, potential for things this season and beyond. And, uh, you know, just about, the, you know, Steve continues to eliminate excuses that we might have for things we can't do. I'm very excited about the, the analytical department and the things that they're going to bring for us to give us hopefully an advantage. And, uh, and all the work Billy and I and, and Sandy are starting to put together, the coaching staff will take our time. And it's just a, it's got the potential to continue to be the great place that it is and was. Uh, so, you know, not a lot of lip service. It's, uh, it's kind of a show me situation. And um, I just want everybody to know that the, you know, the Mets are going to be uh, something that's very precious to the people that that uh, we bring in. And um, it's, a, it's a great responsibility that uh, I and we will take very seriously every day. And uh, there's ebbs and flows to the season, but uh, the consistency of, of how we go about our business and the people we surround ourselves with and how we treat our, our each other is going to be special. And I've missed being part of a team more than anything, and I'm looking forward to being a part of the Mets team, I'm very honored here today. Buck, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, remind everybody on this Zoom to use the raise your hand tab if you'd like to ask a question. And when doing so, if you'll state your name and affiliation and who you'd like you to direct your question to. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to begin with Steve Gelb. Steve, your line is open. Hi, Buck. This is Steve Gelbs from SNY. Congratulations. You know, this is a team that over the last few years has had a, a lot of talent and has just for one reason or another been un unable to get over that hump and, and kind of transition that talent into wins. You're someone who's been known over your years to take on teams and very quickly, you know, create winning cultures and, and winning teams. What is it specifically that you think you bring that can take the talent that's already here and obviously the, the talent that was added and become a winner? You know, every situation, Steve's different. And you try to bring what the players need. You know, you, you try to decide and figure out what the, the needs are, you know, to be, to reach their potential. And um, I think that's, uh, you know, it's not about someone adjusting to me. It's adjusting to the needs of, of the team. And, uh, you know, leaning on uh, Sandy and Billy and a lot of people that are here. I think one of the mistakes people make is when they come into a situation and think everything there isn't good or has to be changed. That, that's, that's a mistake and that won't be done. There's some really quality people here that uh, can be part of it. So I think slow down and not knee jerk. And, you know, I purposely try to have a real clear mind about every, every player 
and uh, trying to make up my own mind about things, but at the same time, lean on people that, that uh, you know, I know, know more than I do. So um, there's no magic sprinkle dust. It's about winning baseball games. You know, it's about, uh, that's really, you know, it's like the chicken, the egg, what comes first? You know, everybody wants to use the word culture, but that's a multifaceted word in my mind. And there's a lot of dynamics that go into that. Uh, the good players part of it, you know, I think uh, ownership is going to be very uh, strong in that backing. Uh, the other part, you know, but then there's another part of it. We have to take it and make it work. You know, it's got to be a team. And uh, like I said before, that's what I've missed the most is being part of a team and uh, having everybody pulling in the same direction. So we'll see. You mentioned the analytics department, and you've seen the game change a whole lot in your you know, decades in it as a manager. What is your general philosophy on, <clears throat> pardon me, the best way to blend the analytics, take that information with the human side of the game that obviously exists? Well, there's a lot of common denominators of uh, teams that win consistently. And I think one of my biggest, one of the biggest things I'm drawn to is teams and situations and organizations that can win consistently. It's so hard to do, especially winning when you're expected to win. But uh, the adaption of different methodology, you know, if you look at certain guys without mentioning names and their ability to do that, it's how they have continued to have success. But, uh, you know, all the information out there, I'll, I'll just say this, David, it, if somebody thinks that I'm going to go back to the hotel or the house and think that maybe we got beat because someone else had better or, or used information better than we did or analytics, whatever you want to call it. You, you don't know me very well. Okay. I, uh, I've always been very spongeful with information to a fault and just like everybody else, I don't have a corner on it. There's a lot of smart people in this game, but if you think that I'm going <laughs> to, uh, let somebody beat us, uh, by having better analytical information or because someone on the staff doesn't understand it, then, I'm not going to talk about it. We'll we'll show you. But there, there's a lot of there's a lot of avenues. You, I, I think one of the things a manager has to do is create avenues where every department feels comfortable and everybody can bring what they bring. You know, I, I'm one of my pet peeves is any type of hazing, whether it be a player, whether it be anything. No, it just doesn't happen. We uh, if you're wearing Mets blue and orange, then you know bring it. Let's go. Bring what you bring and make sure we create a comfortable atmosphere for that to happen in. That the, that's a pretty long answer, huh? <laughs> Thank you, Buck. We're going to go next to uh, Mike Puma. Mike, your line's open. I guess uh, I'll start with a, a question for Sandy or Billy. And I know you can't mention specific players, but did did the opinion of any player you might have uh, just signed who uh, seemed to to like Buck a lot play play into this decision at all? Might have been a pitcher for 130 million. <laughs> I'll take that. Uh, uh, I talk to a lot of different people, uh, no active players, uh, in this process. Uh, but I did, uh, I, I did reach out to some, some people that had played for, uh, uh, for a lot of the candidates actually, um, in this, in this process. So, uh, checked with coaches that have coached with people, uh, you know, general managers or presidents that have, uh, have managed them. So, uh, you know, really cast a, a wide net when we were, uh, when we were looking into the, into the candidates. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, nothing, nothing specific. And I, I did not, uh, I did not speak with any active player. And also for, for Buck, you had success in Baltimore, took the team to the playoffs three times. The last two seasons weren't so great. It didn't end on a, on a, on a great note. I'm just wondering kind of, uh, what happened at the end and, you know, and then, you know, you, you were away for three years uh, from managing, just uh, looking back on that. Well, the first part, I'm the, uh, I'd rather ask for the end. So we got to get to all of them, right? So, you know, one, you know, it, it's painful when you start seeing something that's come together and because of our situation in Baltimore and the way that we had to do it, we knew that there was going to be an end at some point and you don't want to pull the plug too early, so to speak, and not be competitive. 
uh, when you think you still might be, if you want to make that last as long as possible. And when we had to start moving players to try to gain as much um, as we could uh, to get back to try to go forward, it was painful. It was painful. It's like when you put something together, like uh, the whole organization did, and you start seeing it coming to an end. It's painful, but you know you have to take some some bullets along the way in order to get to the end game that hopefully at some point uh, Baltimore will be able to get back to that competitive part. Um, you know, I will say this, I, I was very, what really caught my eye was how impressed I was with the candidates that Sandy and, and Billy had put together. Um, same guys that I would be talking to. So I'm very honored to, you know, to be mentioned in the same name as, as some of the people they talked to because I knew the background work that, uh, Billy and Sandy were doing to try to make a good decision. Uh, what was the first question? Let me make sure I get all your questions answered. There were about three of them. I'll get the tough one out of the way first about what happened in Baltimore. Is that good enough? What else? I wish I knew sometimes. I think you covered it. Thank no, you. That, what was the first part? There was something else I think you asked. All right, no, Mike. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to you, Mike. And uh, Mike, appreciate the reminder that, uh, as everybody knows, due to the lockout, that uh, we're restricted from speaking specifically about any players. So thank you for uh, for following along those guidelines that we're uh, restricted to. Uh, next question will come from Tony DeComo. Hey, Buck. Anthony DeComo.com. Hey, uh, congrats. Welcome back to New York. I'm just curious in your decades of experience, how has the job changed in terms of collaboration with the front office? What are your expectations for that here? And I would pose the same question to Billy, hiring an experienced manager such as Buck, uh, you know, how do you expect that to kind of unfold in terms of collaboration between the dugout and the front office and the things you guys are doing? I think, I think collaboration is a great word. It's not a new word in the language. It's, you know, the great organizations almost in any sport have a real connectivity between the general manager, the field staff, and, and the ownership. And it's uh, something I know is not going to be a challenge here because I, I know from being around, you know, Billy and Sandy and, uh, and now Steve, uh, the passion that Steve has for the Mets and the city and the fans, and not necessarily in that order because he, he – uh, it's, that's one thing that was very uh, apparent to me early on in the conversation is the, the love and passion that Steve and Alex have for the Mets and the things that they're willing to do to, and uh, that's exciting. But I think the whole relationship, just about everywhere I've been, uh, that relationship with the general manager in front office has been fun for one thing, because it's, there's nothing like being a part of, and you, you got that feeling that everybody's, pulling in the same direction and you have your, your times when you're, you're, you're bouncing things off each other and you have a certain vulnerability uh, that you should have and let people see that, you know, you have an opinion, but at the same time you have respect for other people's opinion. There's a lot of very smart people in this game. And, uh, you know, I, if anything, I'll be accused of asking too many opinions and that's how you find out. And I'm, I'm looking forward to picking Billy's brain and a lot of the people I had a, Hour plus conversation with uh, Jeremy yesterday, Hefner, a pitching coach. Very impressed with his uh, his knowledge of, of things. He had. Uh, I can't wait to get back on the phone with him. To be honest with you, but um, just trying to play catch up and not uh, leave anything uh, stone unturned as you go forward. But you know, there's a lot of challenges you face on the field between the lines. Uh, the, the collaboration part of it. Uh, that's that won't be one of them. Yeah, and just and just to, just to add on the on the back of that, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, that that we instituted as part of the part of the interview process was, you know, some break off sessions or breakout sessions um, that uh, that the candidates went through with, you know, members of uh, the performance science group, uh, members of the scouting group, members of uh, the player development group, the analytics group. Um, so. Um, we could, you know, kind of set the stage for, for that, that connectivity and, and, uh, you know, kind of the collaborative and inclusive environment that, uh, you know, I talked about in my introductory press conference and something that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're making part of our, uh, of our culture here. And so, um, you know, obviously with, with the Mets, um, and, and Steve and Alex's, uh, uh, ownership and their commitment to the organization, you know, we've been able to, to add, or I've kind of witnessed from afar, 
uh, the addition of a lot of a lot of resources, whether that's on the performance side, whether that's on the scouting side, whether that's on the analytics side, and you know the uh, you know the purpose of those departments is, is is to serve the organization, serve the major league club, serve serve the the minor league, serve the scouting efforts, um, and uh, you know Buck through his experiences you know, in a lot of different places has seen a lot of different ways of, of doing things and has, has kind of watched the, watched the game evolve. So, um, you know, what came across, um, in the, in the interview, um, was a lot of curiosity, um, and a lot of questions about, you know, how, how that group, um, or how some of the new, um, methods and, 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 and ways, uh, of doing things, you know, can ultimately lead to, to, you know, better player performance and, and, and a better result on the field. So, um, it's definitely, a kind of an all hands on deck, uh, operation. And, uh, you know, we look forward to, to lots of, uh, you know, lots of conversations, you know, leading up to games and conversations after the games and, you know, working through the, uh, working through the baseball calendar together. Thanks guys. Thank you. Disha Thosar, your line is open. Disha Thosara uh, with the New York Daily News. Good to see you again, Buck. Um, winning a World Series is obviously missing from your resume. Is that the biggest motivator in wanting to get back in the dugout here with the Mets? Um, you'd like that always to be the end game. You know, it'd be pretty uh, self-serving, selfish to have that. Uh, it's not something that is going to define my life, but I can tell you this, it does wake me up every day now because but I think impacting people's lives uh, whether it be players, whether it try to give them some shortcuts so they don't step on their tail like I did, different things and learn. But uh, obviously winning the World Series is what, you know, Billy and uh, Sandy and Steve asked me, you know, why would I want to do this again? And that's the quick answer. You know, we'd be the last team standing. Not once. You know, you'd like to do it, you know, obviously it's going to be very hard to do. There are a lot of great people. You know, it's 30 of the best you know, baseball has to offer 30 teams. And uh, so that's what makes it most, much more gratifying if you can reach it. But, you know, it sounds selfish if, if to say that that's the only reason and this is an avenue to it. I don't look at it like that. I look at it as, you know, the end game, if you can stay involved in the day-to-day -day operation, then the end game is something that everybody's successful in the result of it. So I understand the job description. The job description here isn't to be competitive or try to win uh, 80 more games than you lose. It's to be the last team, last team standing. And um, that's the focus. You know, how do we get better every day? You just try each day and see where it takes you. Thank you. And then I have one more for Billy. Uh, you said early in the managerial search that your goal would be to hire a manager who's a 10 out of 10. Um, how close does Buck come to that perfect score? Um, yeah, easy. you know, it, it, see, <laughs> well, go ahead, Buck. No, easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, um, you know, we, we set up a lot of the criteria for what we were looking for, right. Where there's connectivity to players, staff, uh, you know, the ability to, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to speak with the media, be comfortable in the media, be comfortable in this type of environment in New York, uh, you know, embracing a lot of, um, uh, maybe, you know, I don't even want to call it unconventional, um, but, but in embracing a lot of, a lot of tactics, you know, in an effort to kind of serve run prevention, run scoring, and then, you know, getting involved in, in the performance science, um, you know, kind of a, a new nifty word that, uh, that they use nowadays, but what that really means is player, player, you know, player care, player health, and in, in the service of, you know, player availability. Um, and then somebody that can, that can mentor and grow, um, you know, coaching staff, but just in, in general, just a staff, um, around them. I think we're all looking to, to learn off of each other. So, so Buck checked everyone's any, any every one of those boxes, uh, well, through the, through the interview process. So, so that's where we're headed. Go ahead. Buck, what you got? Really not both. No, the only 10 sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say this, uh, Buck came as close as anybody in baseball possibly can to 10 out of 10. Um, you know, Buck's been around for a long time. First managerial job in 1992. Uh, I actually tried to hire him as manager of the Oakland A's a few years ago before he uh, decided to go to Arizona. But you don't last as long as Buck has, and you don't remain as interested in a person 
uh, uh, who's been out of the game for three years, if that person hasn't been adaptable, if that person hasn't been curious, if that person hasn't been able to evolve with the game itself. And so, you know, a lot of these uh, issues about analytics and so forth to me are interesting topics, but uh, given what Buck has done in the past, relied on as much information as, as has been available to him and as adaptable as he, as he has been to the way the game has changed over time uh, and still be curious and energetic uh, <clears throat> and motivated by the task at hand here in New York, um, he has come as close to 10 out of 10 as anybody possibly can. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, next question will come from Tim Britton. Go ahead, Tim. Hi, it's Tim Britton from The Athletic. Uh, for Buck and Billy, you know, how much did you two know each other personally before this process? And what have you learned about each other through this process uh, to know how your, your relationship might work over the next several years? Um, Go ahead, Buck. Go ahead, Buck. Okay, I uh, obviously have known Billy from afar, you know, the reputation, you know, listening to uh, different people that come in contact with him, the passion. Uh, I know how much Gene Michael uh, loved Billy and the things that he, he brought. And um, I remember him talking to me every time we would come into the stadium to play, he would stick his head in and and uh, somewhere along the line, he said, that, you know, he used to say, you got to beat this guy. He's, he's going to be a good one. And, uh, you know, interviewing out in Anaheim uh, a few years back, uh, spending some time, I could see very quickly what everybody was talking about, and uh, I just love the passion, the energy, the uh, just the bulldogness where he wants to just, uh, you know, he's one of those guys that answers the phone on the, the first ring. How can we make the Mets better today? I mean, it's just uh, he's on all the time. He doesn't have an off button, and it's about, you know, obviously he's got his priorities from a family standpoint there, but. Uh, I can tell that he's going to share a real connectivity to the day-to-day -day grind it takes to get where we want to go. Billy. Yeah. And, and, and Tim, um, it's a good question. Um, because you know, my, my, uh, upbringing in the game or a lot of my, my upbringing in the game, um, in those, in those developmental years in, in New York, the first time around, you know, would hear a lot of the stories about Buck and, and, and we've had, um, some common, common mentors, um, you know, in the game and, and Gene Michael, um, gets recognized a lot, but he, but even Bill Livesey, um, is somebody that, you know, I kind of come through that, come through that tree, um, when it comes to player evaluation, um, and, and clearly with, with Brian Cashman as well. And so, um, there's a lot of common denominator. Um, you know, uh, watching Buck across the, across the diamond, or I guess, you know, from, from my vantage point, maybe, you know, in the stands, uh, you know, he, uh, he, he, <laughs> he really runs a, a, a really good game and, uh, was kind of a, a pain in the butt in a good way, um, for some of the teams that I was, a was, I was a part of, and, uh, you just really appreciated, uh, you know, his ability to, to really, you know, drive, uh, his, his clubs, um, to, it, it seemed like squeeze every single ounce, um, of ability out of those, out of those players, how they played the game. Everybody was in the right spot at the, at, you know, at the, at the times that they needed to be there. Um, you know, if you, if you paid attention to things that were going on away from the ball, um, and, and looking up the, uh, looking up what some of the left fielder might be doing or the right fielder might be doing or the catcher might be doing or just, it was, it just moved in such a way where, um, I just, you know, always had this, had this respect for him. Um, and then getting a chance to, to really sit and, and talk in a little bit more detail with him a few years back, um, you know, felt that, felt that connection there and that, then that common denominator and how we, um, you know, look at the world, um, and the, and the types of standards that, um, you know, that we have in a, in a, you know, highly competitive environment, such as, such as professional baseball. So there was a lot of, a lot of things that, um, and I think we shared, um, you know, shared our view on. Thank you, Billy. Uh, Joel, your line is open. Thanks, Harold. Uh, Buck, I'm going to assume the coordination of uh, your shirt and Angela's dress is your wife uh, in Met Blue. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, you manage players in the 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 2020s. Do you think players are players 
or do you do you believe you have to manage in a very different way today than you would in other places along the lines? You know, first of all, I I love that everybody else has a first and last name. Joel's like Michael, Adele, uh, Rihanna, perfect. It was Joel, and everybody knew. Nice going, Joel. God <laughs> bless you. I've known Joel for a while, but uh, you know, it's funny. I, I was been talking to some people along the way. Uh, Tony Larusa, Dusty Baker, even Joe Madden, everybody, you know, just, I, I want to pick their brain about what can I expect? What might be different? You know, it's not like I've been out for 10 years. I've been pretty connected through television because I was responsible for 30 teams instead of one, but, uh, you know, I'm anxious to see, I'm going to go into it with an open mind. I do think you have to do certain things the same, you know, as far as, you know, the, the things that allow you to win a baseball game, you know, it's about a, it's a 90, 90 foot increment game, obviously 360 feet happened with a home run, but you know, the people that can def, you know keep you from going 90 feet, you know, whether that be pitching defense, uh, you know, people in the right place, et cetera, or how do we gain 90 feet, whether it be a base on balls or, or whatever. Um, it's about trying to attack the 90 feet of the game, but I'm, I can't wait to sit down with some of these people. You know, I think a lot of people lose sight sometimes that we haven't had the luxury of analytics and without, you know, trying to be negative towards place you've been, you know, so what do you do? You have to adapt. You have to, have to figure out a way to do some other things better than the people you're competing against. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think Billy made a good point and so did Sandy about the curiosity uh, to embrace, but at the same time, you want to find out what things tell you and why and what things don't tell you. There's always, uh, you know, we want to make sure we cover the separator between, you know, a lot of people looking at a lot of the similar numbers, depending on what you want to weight and what your analytics, but what are you, what are you willing to, to, uh, uh, you know, do the things that are further away from analytics, you know, you want to be well-rounded in every part of it and make everybody, like I said, feel comfortable bringing what they bring. I can't wait. You know, Sandy and Dusty both said it's, it's going to be, you're going to really enjoy some of the stuff out there. And I, I don't want to act like it's Braille. Some I don't know. We were, we've been using the best stuff that were available to us. I'm looking forward to the, uh, the things that Steve has made available to us. We have eliminated another excuse. Okay, I mean, I, I just to follow up on that is I, I was talking about specifically dealing with the interrelationship with players. Um, do you? I, I'm not. I mean, I was around. Not that you said jump in 1992 and someone jumped, but there was a probably a different uh, manager to player leadership then than maybe exists today. Do you believe that? And do you think you have to um, behave with players or treat players or connect with players in a different way in 2022 than in 1992? So, you know, yes and no. Okay. It's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say it again. You know, it's about what do the players need from me? And without naming names, because I know all you know, the situation we're in with that, but, you know, it's trying to bring what a player needs, you know, and trying to evaluate what they need. And, you know, your ego is not as such that you, you know, you don't, uh, you have that vulnerability to deliver it. And uh, I mean, that's the end game. The game's about the players. It's about creating an environment that, that makes their skills come to the top and, you know, being proactive with things before you, you have to react to them, to have your finger on the pulse of, of things in there. And it's about, you know, who the players want to be, you know, who do we want to be? What do we want to be about? Because, you know, a long time ago, somebody named Billy Martin told me, he said, Hey, you got to do what's right. You know, players will might mourn you for five minutes. I understand the shelf life of managers. So you bring what is needed by the players and the organization and you understand what your job description is to uh, get them to play at the apex of their game. Now, whether I have to, you know, if there's something different going in on, I'll know what music they're listening to, Joe. I'll know what, believe it or not, I'll know what uh, certain styles that they like and whatever, you know, hey, I look forward to that. I mean, it's part of life. It's, it's fun. And uh, they might be surprised at uh, some of the songs I'll be humming around the locker room. Uh, Bruce Beck, we will come to you next. Buck, welcome back. Uh, Bruce Beck, WNBC TV. We hear a lot that you demand accountability on the field and in the clubhouse. So how would you define accountability and how vital is it for success? Well, it's once again, you know, the, 
there are times, Steve, where you, you walk through a locker room and you know you got it going on. And you might have lost the day before. That was You felt like it was a fluke. And there are times you've been in a lot of locker rooms. You walk through, and even though you won, you know there's something not quite right. So that accountability for the players, I mean, it's about them. You know, what do they want to be about? It's about the players, you know. And, and the byproduct of that is about the fans. I mean, it's a real simple job description. And, you know, what do they want to be about? I and the coaching staff can talk about all these things and all this lip service, but, you know, what are they willing to embrace to get what we want, where we want to get? And this isn't some, you know, dictatorial, do as I say, don't ask questions. I want them to ask questions about everything we're doing because we're going to have good reasons. And or I'm going to pick their brains about a, a way to do it better. You know, tell me what you need from me. You know, tell me what you need from the staff. You, you try to eliminate all the possible excuses and all the sympathetic ears to the BS that won't allow us to win baseball games. It's not that it ain't as complicated as we make it sometimes. Sorry, you got me going. <laughs> Thank you, Buck. Eddie C., we'll come to you next. Your line's open. Ed Coleman, WFAN, WCBS Mets Radio. Buck, welcome back to New York. Hey, how uh, you doing? I'm good. Uh, Merry Christmas to you, Angela. Um, I, my question was on collaboration, but I think you guys kind of covered that before. So I'll, I'll just ask you about what your perception of the Mets has been over the last couple of years. This is a team with a lot of expectations, but hasn't quite gotten there over the last couple of seasons. But as an onlooker, as an analyst, what was your perception of this of this team? You know, obviously, they're, they're you are who you are when a season's over. There are no Cinderella's in baseball. If you're if you're one of those teams in the playoffs, it's, there's for a reason. And if you're one that's not, there's a reason there. And you, uh, Ed, you know, I've been on teams that uh, expansion year that you you went through parts of the year where you ended up being very bad uh, record wise, but there were parts of that season where you didn't think you'd lose another game. And on the flip side of that, I've, I've been fortunate to manage teams that won 100 games, and there are parts of that season where you didn't know if you'd ever win another game. So you, you keep in mind on, the, on the, the reality, and uh, I'm trying to keep a clear mind. I want every player to think that, hey, I'm coming in there with a, a lot of uh, open-mindedness about what happened. You know, we don't want to repeat the past, and certainly you're aware of it, but you don't want them to think that you think that's going to be the case forever. So I, I got a clear mind about it, and, you know, Billy and I have talked a lot. Of, you know, I kind of want them to walk into camp knowing that, you know, this is a fresh start for everybody, but, you know, it, and there's so much, okay, it's about injuries. Oh, it's about this guy was out of position. This, that, okay, it, it's, it's just, I think everybody wants to, you know, show me the end game here. All this other stuff, I got it. We all have opinions about it. Thank God we do, and thank God people care. You know, if you don't think people care about the New York Mets, and if somebody's not willing to take that responsibility in the locker room, I, you know, this isn't something you put your headphones on and say that, you know, I don't want to listen to it. It's there, but it's a. It, there's no place like it when you get it right, and that's what uh, when you get it right. And there's a lot of people living and dying with what you're trying to do every day. So there is an accountability and responsibility to that, and it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. We're going to try to find out who it's for, who, who's who's in, who ain't. Mike Macaro, your line is open. Hey, Buck. Welcome back to New York. Hey, Mike. I'm curious, you uh, you cut your teeth as a young manager uh, under George Steinbrenner uh, back at a time when he was larger than life, for better or for worse. What did that experience, uh, how did that inform, how was that informed the rest of your career and how you deal with bosses, with, with, with situations, with things that could be a little more, you know, out of the box than most guys have to deal with? Well, you know, first of all, it's always an honor to get a chance, you know, and I started out in you know, as a player and then as a coach and then as a manager in minor leagues, you know, I don't think you heard me complain. You know, I knew the job description uh, in New York and, um, you know, Mr. Steinmer gave me a chance to support my family and be in a game that I loved dearly for 19 years over there. And I was always thankful to this. I saved some letters he wrote me after it was, after I had left. I mean, after the death of my father, I mean, it, uh, you know, it very touching, but, uh, very demanding, you know, but you knew the job description. You know, when you left camp as a minor league manager, you had two jobs, develop players and win your league. Not necessarily in that order. You know, winning was always at a paramount. And I, you know, it's funny, sometimes in the minor leagues, uh, if you're, you're losing games, but you're developing players, 
Well, sometimes learning how to win is a part of development too. Billy and I have talked about this. And, um, you know, I'm glad that that situation's in great hands here between the scouting and player development. It was a real draw for me seeing the people they had in place there. Uh, that's exciting. But, you know, I was fortunate. And I, uh, I learned a lot on the ways about what to do and what not to do. And you know, we learn as much from people about maybe there's a better way to handle a situation along the way. But, you know, I've I've always been very positive about my experience with Mr. Steinbrenner, and, and uh, he shared the same passion for winning that, uh, you know, Stick and I did. And, uh, you know, he didn't tolerate, uh, you know, guys that didn't share that passion. So I was very lucky in a lot of ways, but I've had some great owners along the way. Uh, and that's why I'm so excited about Steve, uh, the passion that he and Alex have. You know, we keep talking. She's become very uh, – people are constantly talking about her involvement and in things uh, on and off the field where the Met Foundation things come into play. So it just seems like there's a lot of things in place and some people have worked very hard to uh, give us a chance. So we got to take it and run with it. But the experience with Mr. Steinbrenner and our owners, different owners along the way, you know, I've learned a lot uh, from them and always going to be thankful for the opportunity they gave me. Next question, uh, we'll go to Jake Siner. There you go, Jake. There, got it. Yep. Hey, Buck, Jake Siner with the AD. Uh, welcome back to New York. Um, I know you haven't been away from the dugout for that long, but there are a lot of strategies that have boomed or evolved in that time. You know, the Rays were experimenting with the, the opener in 2018. Defensive shifts have nearly doubled in that time. There's all the things Billy talked about with performance science. Uh, I know the Orioles, you, you guys were shifting. You were pretty aggressive on shifting when you were there. I know you had some relievers who started games in 2018. I don't know if those were openers exactly, but I'm curious just as you've watched from kind of a step removed as some of these things have, have changed, um, is there anything you've been impressed by or inspired by or surprised by and any developments you see happening that um, you disagree with? Well, you know, you, you call it opener. Some people might call it a spot start. Uh, you know, I think every one of these teams would love to have five starters where they didn't have to do it. You know, Tampa would love to have five stars. I can't name names of players. You could pick out one on their staff. And But, you know, so what are you going to do, not compete? So you think of the other things. Uh, you think of uh, necessity breeds a lot of things. And uh, it's about competing. You know, Billy and I hope to find five, six, seven. You know, the depth of a pitching staff uh, you know, attacking the what ifs. Uh, it's not a normal thing to do to your body to play seven days a week for seven or eight months so you can roll the dice in October. So you better, uh, you know, be able, I think, from the health standpoint, uh, but looking at different things that have come into the game, there are a different form of some things that were done before. But uh, I'm anxious to, to, to uh, understand some of the probabilities. Uh, when you do certain things, there's a return for all of it. I'm fascinated by it. I, uh, believe me, there's some guys down in there that are going to say, geez, can I get a break here from him? I'm going to, I can't wait to find out my uh, curiosity. And, and the bottom line is about, can, is there an inch way we can make the match better that day? And I, like I said, I don't want to go back to the hotel or the house and think that someone beat us because they were, and I know Steve and Sandy and Billy feel the same way. They're, they're just, they're willing to do whatever it takes uh, to see if we can get an edge and you're constantly striving for it. And that's why you look at guys without naming coaches that adapt and I'm looking forward, but I've adapted my whole career because things have changed since when I first came in, you know, heck Angela used to do charts for me in the Florida state league about where guys would hit the ball. She can still remember the colored pencils and the different hump and the lines and the different checks about which pitchers. And there was, this was Florida state league in a ball. You know, that was, now we were shifting a little bit on six at bats. Now we've got 600. So obviously the technology is better, but, I still got those charts. I can name the five starting pitchers. She can too. And what color pencil they all had. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That answer you. Thank you, Buck. Uh, John Harper, we're going to come to your line next. Hold on, John. I'm getting you unmuted here. Mm -hmm. 
John, we'll come back to you there, uh, give you a chance to uh, unmute. Uh, James Wagner, we'll come to you. Your line is open. Hey, Buck, it's uh, James Wagner from the New York Times. Congratulations, uh, Hi, Angela. How are you? Good. Uh, I mean, in, in, a, in a normal year, I guess, in the transition to this new job, I mean, you'd reach out to players and get to know them, start calling, texting them. What, what has that transition been like, given the unique nature of the lockout? And, and I guess, how will you, I guess, handle like getting to know people if you can't talk to everyone? So. Yeah, I can't. And, and I can't and I won't. You know, obviously, it's uh, there's some other things going on. It, it is going to be a challenge, but fortunately, nobody's going to have a head start on us. Uh, I've been with two uh, situations like this where you had shortened spring trainings. I mean, that's my focus right now is making sure that, you know, I was talking to Jeremy about it yesterday, that we're focused on um, – a shortened spring training potential. And the biggest challenge of that is the pitchers. The pitchers, I'm hoping that doesn't happen for the Mets fans and for us. It certainly would make spring training a lot easier, but out of my, can't control it. So we have to prepare for the what ifs of a shorter spring training. And uh, that's going to be a challenge. And, and the communication part of that, that will catch up with very quickly. Uh, you know, that's just on, the onus is on us to get that done. That, you know, I want to make the player's path as easy as possible, but, um, Getting a team ready and a potential short spring training is, is going to be, you know, shame on us if we're not prepared for that when it happens. Because usually a normal spring training, you've got a buffer period where, you know, if you have a setback with a spring training arm or a leg or whatever or a sore shoulder, you've got time for that to come back and make the start of the season. But if you shorten up spring, that buffer or safety net won't be there. But it's going to be tough. I, but I, I'm okay with it as long as everybody else is not doing it. Uh, Harp, let's try to come back to you. Your line is open. All right. Hey, Buck, good to see you, John Harp. Hey, John. Hey, uh, you talked about this. How, you know, you've always wanted information, but analytics now does seem to be changing the game in some ways. Specifically, you talk about you know maybe starting pitching. Analytics tells you a guy you may not want a guy to face the third, line up a third time around. How do you weigh that with you know what your eyes are telling you, and how much do you trust that in terms of uh, making those decisions? weighing them against the analytics? Well, I think the probabilities play in, but there's also some emotional part of it. You do have to take, and, and you know, they're gonna, we're gonna have a great feed into the probabilities of things and what the, the, the you know, percentages tell you what something could or couldn't happen. We've been using that forever, but I think we're gonna have a lot better information. But, but there's a lot of factors that go into the final decision. You know, uh, are you at home? Are you on the road? Uh, what do you got your schedule there? If you bring this guy in this, you know, where are you at with your bullpen? There's so many factors uh, that figure into the final decision. It's not just a black and white. Okay. He's thrown X number of pitches and they've gone around the order X number of times. And I'll be aware of all that. And it'll figure into the factor. And it'll also who the human being is out on the mound, you know, the heartbeat of a, of a, of a pitcher and what have you. And there's going to be, some things done along the line that's going to make uh, maybe a pitcher or somebody not particularly happy. That's part of it. You know, one of your jobs as a manager is to wear certain things. You know, you're always got to be careful about telling things that hurt innocent people. So, you know, that's part of my job description to put us in the best situation. And there's an end game. There's always an end game. And what happens in one game, you might not put your best foot forward for that game, but it puts you in a position to win the next three or four games and to have the vision about, you know, what's happening down the road and how all your decisions affect there's arteries of decisions. And I think you got to keep that in mind. Tina Servacio, uh, your line is open. Thanks, Harold. Hi, Buck. Congratulations. And great to see you, Angela. Congratulations to you as well. Buck, you've been talking a lot about the players and you have managed uh, some of the biggest stars in this game. I mean, and you had multiple superstars on the Yankees and when you were at Arizona and you don't have to talk, we can't talk specifically, but that is the case on this current Mets roster. What is the challenge in managing these superstars and how do you approach it? Or is there something that you're looking forward to about having these type of men on this roster? Well, it, it's always a fascination to, you know, thank gosh that everybody's not robotic. And, you know, I want everybody, the last thing I'm going to ever do is suppress a personality or a, uh, the way somebody goes, you know, everything's different. You, you can't just throw a blanket over everybody. That's part of the fun. Can you imagine how boring it would be if everybody was exactly the same? And 
uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know these guys and basically finding out what they need from me and the coaching staff. You know, we're there. To, and if there's uh, – and there's going to be some bumps along the way. But, you know, these are the best players in the world. And so you need to understand that the, I just – someone asked earlier, what did you see from afar? You know, it, it was like there are all these different – talented players, but over the course of the season, certain things um, get exposed from a team standpoint uh, because the psyche and the mental uh, and emotional part of the game really plays on you in a long season. And I think to try to keep that consistency of, you know, I want them to walk through the door every day and know exactly what they're getting from me or from the coaching staff, that, that the reactions are consistent and the message and the, and the accountability is, is consistent. Uh, but, uh, it's fun. Okay. It's fun. And I'm looking forward to having the fun of getting to know these guys and, and seeing what I can bring to help them. Next up, we'll go to uh, Bob Clappish. Bob, your line is open. Hey, Bob. Good to see you. Hey, um, I have uh, two questions for you. First, uh, until this opportunity came along, had you stopped getting your hopes up about getting another managerial job? And the second part is, um, Will it work to your advantage in any way that you are now in your 60s and that you have a there's a there's an age gap between you and your players as opposed to when you first started? You were in your 30s and you were sort of in you know, sort of in the same generation of many of your players. So I'm wondering about the pluses and minuses now, uh, just in terms of of um, your age. Well, um, let's let's go uh, backwards for maybe it's advantage. I don't know. Ask me ask me in a year or so, Bob. I. Uh, I remember for years people were telling me I was too young. Then I was, I'm not sure. And, and then, I've, you know, it's funny. The other day I had some time on the on the train and I was looking at ages of different guys in different sports. I, I, I tell you what, I'm actually one of the younger guys now. I think if I look at it of some of those guys, but I don't know. I sometimes I want to go to Dusty and uh, and Joe and and Tony. Hey, thanks. You know, could you imagine if they had, uh, you know, stepped on their tail and not done well with their teams? Right. So, you know, there's you know, certain people that kind of paved the way. Uh, Clap, what was your first part of your question? I guess so. Was it, uh, the question was before this Met opportunity came along. Yeah. Did you pretty much, you know, yeah. get off managing uh, again? You know, I, I didn't stay up at night. You know, as Angela will tell you, it, it was one of those things that wasn't going to define my life. It was about how you treat people and the way you want to. You know, impact people about things that they didn't even that no one even knows about, and um, I it, it really I gotta tell you, about, it wasn't something I stay up at night. It was always an honor when someone kicked my name around or uh, because of the history you've had. But there's so many good people out there. That's why I was so impressed with the the list that I saw that Sandy and Billy were putting together because I knew they were headed down the right uh, the right path. And um, just to be in that group, uh, especially in today's game. But, you know, we would love to have had a lot more analytics, for instance, in Baltimore. We just didn't have the funding for it. And I'm looking forward to having one, to be honest with you, a program. Otis Livingston, we will come to you. Your line's open. Otis Livingston, uh, sports director at WCBS2. Uh, welcome back to New York, Buck and Angela. Congratulations on the job. Uh, I have two parter. Um, first off, we've heard from a lot of coaches in other sports and managers that when they step away from the, from the sport, they learn something. They, what do you feel like you learned that you will implement in your managerial style to make you a, an even better manager this time around? And also, um, it seemed from the outset that you were the favorite. Um, we're not going to talk about the pitcher who endorsed you, and it seemed like the man, uh, the owner, also wanted you right off the top. How good does it feel to kind of be the front runner going in and to land the job and come back to New York? Well, thanks. That's a good question about the evolution. You know, I, I hope you evolve. It's you know the old expression "adapt or die." It, but we do that because of the situations we've been exposed to. You know, shame on us if we've got some. Uh, stubborn, you know, this is my way. And there are different ways to do it. You know, every spring we have a book with team defenses that changes. 
you know, we talked to J.J. Hardy or Derek Jeter or, or Francisco Lindor about how did you do it in Cleveland? How did you do that? You know, you adapt to, to the talent you have and the people you have. There's not – and you, and you welcome the feedback with the players about what do you think? You know, how, how do you feel about this? This is why we're thinking we're doing it. Do you have a better way? You know, when they, they take in that, hey, I've got a stake in this. It's responsible. You know, I'm responsible for it. So, the, you know, evolve, you know, uh, that's been the easy part, you know, because you, you, you have such a curiosity about how to get better. You know, what are they doing? You know, we steal a lot of stuff. I remember, I won't name a manager, he beat us the next year with a team defense and a bunt defense that we were had been using. He, he stole ours and used the same thing. I look over, he tips his hat at me. I go, what? what is the greatest form of flattery? Is What is imitation? You know, so I'm going to, hey, if I see something I like with somebody else or a player's got a good idea, you know, if you let your ego get in the way of your team being better and the Mets being better, then shame on you. Uh, what was the second part of that? You got me going. I, th I think it was, but just the how good did it feel to land in New York yeah. uh, as a player? Well, he was talking about being a favorite. I don't know about that. When I, <laughs> I know it was very close. And, it, and if uh, somebody made the call that uh, Billy and Sandy and, and Steve had hired somebody else, I'd go nice going, and I'd have called them and said because they had some great candidates. It was like I said, an honor to be considered. And I tell you, I have yet to read anything. Angela, you know, I'll just say, hey, if there's something there I need to know about that I might get ambushed about or whatever, let me know. Otherwise, I've, I purposely stayed away from everything. So if somebody said or written something real nice, thank you. If somebody's written something the other way, I understand there's two sides to every issue, uh, but I'm trying. So if somebody was considered this or that, I wish they had told me to save us a little uh, anguish along the way. <laughs> We have time for a couple more. Uh, Pat Regazzo, your line's open. Pat Regazzo of Sports Illustrated. Hey, Buck, welcome back hey, and congratulations. Um, you talked a lot about, you know, coming in and learning what the players, you know, need from you and, you know, adapting to the personalities. But how do you keep some of the superstar talent on the roster more grounded and making sure that everyone kind of feels equal and not above the team? Well, you know, it's funny. What's, what's fair for one may not be fair for another one. You know, it's, uh, I don't know, in the spring, sometimes all the guys are wondering whether, why they're going on a road trip or whatever. There's a, a thing up there that has service time, you know, We're, you know, so there, there's some tiebreakers along the way, but uh, that's a challenge for everybody. It seems like that, uh, but the last thing you want to do is come in and try to suppress a lot of, you know, if anything, I want everybody to feel comfortable about uh, their personality fitting into but there's got to be a reason for things that you do. You know, it's uh, everything's got to be about the Mets. It's got to be, you know, you got to charge to keep with the fans, the city, you know, people that are, are really, you know, living and dying with everything you do out there. And it's, it's a great responsibility. Some people run from it. So I think from a trying to, you know, I don't think people in the locker room look at guys as he's, He's this X star and he can do this and he can do that. I tell you what's really been attractive to me is watching Billy and Sandy and Steve, the type of people they've added in the off season. And in some cases they might've subtracted, you know, that sometimes your best addition is that. So, you know, you look at Marte and you look at uh, Eduardo and you, you look at, uh, you know, obviously I can't mention names. So I'm going to shut up. So, yeah, I just like the way they've gone about their name. The, the people that they've added would have been people I would have been interested in, too. Kevin Kernan, your line is open. Almost got there. That's the first time I messed up, right? Okay. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> Hey, hey, Bach, congratulations. Uh, I'm not going to ask you about the state of college football in Florida, but I am going to ask you about was there a leadership gap in baseball? You mentioned some of these managers that uh, kind of helped repave the way for you. Leadership gap in the dugout. Do you think uh, going to guys like you can uh, help that situation? You know, Kevin, somewhere along the way, somebody took a chance on me. So when I see a young manager, or I see somebody coming in. And, um, you know, when I signed a one-year contract years ago, um, you know, you're on a one-year plan. So it's somewhere... I worry sometimes that we're not developing the managers sometime in the minor leagues that we, that we need to, you know, you want to have that flow of, of it. Uh, you know, the, 
I think because the job description of minor league managers is so different today, and I have a respect for what they're trying to get them to do. But, you know, along the way, um, I think sometimes we lose that, that uh, some of the things that managers have to have during the course of a game. So, you know, I watch, you know, some things, sometimes change is good. You never confuse change with a lack of respect for tradition. You know, you try not to get in, get in that, go down that vibe because, you know, you, you respect the tradition of baseball, but sometimes there's a ways to make things better. And sometimes something new may not be better. So I think you, you, you try to challenge everything with an open mind. And I'm going to be open to everything, but I'm also going to challenge, uh, you know, how did we get to that equation and how does that help us win a game in the eighth inning when you got five seconds to make a decision? You know, don't bring it in after the fact. I want to have an avenue where you feel comfortable bringing it in, but know that you're going to get, uh, you know, okay, that's good. How did you arrive at that, and how does that help us? Let's uh, sneak in one final question, uh, Buck. Uh, Jerry Beach, go ahead. Your line's open. Hey, Buck. Uh, I was just, uh, I'm from Forbes.com, and uh, I was just wondering what it was like the last, for you the last three years, when you're uh, so close to the game, broadcasting it, talking about it, but not on the field. Like you said, that's the one thing you miss the most of all. What's that like for you being so close to it, observing it every day, still sort of on the outside? Well, if I had to do something, I don't know, you know the, the people at MLB Network and the way they treated me, and that, that was fun. And also, when the game was over and the Yes Network we, were great, I mean, I couldn't ask, you know, John Filippelli and the people there, you know, Jared, they were great. And my issue, the good thing was that when the game was over, I put my head on the pillow and went to sleep. You know, it's funny, a few days ago, I I was up, went to bed late, got up early, and my wife walked in and said, it's already started. You know, it's a, it's a labor of love, but uh, I couldn't imagine if I had to be off the field and, and it may have been a permanent thing. I was at peace with that. It was, it was a great situation. Um, so, you know, I had to think about it. You know, maybe this is where, you know, I needed or could or should be, you know, here we want to say it. So when this opportunity came along, um, you know, that was obviously something I wanted to do. But, you know, being with them and being involved in the game to that point and being able to stay on top of the personnel and the people involved in it, it was a great honor. But man, they, uh, I know they put it up, put up with me. And, you know, some of the things you do to describe action in a dugout kind of gets, uh, kind of handicaps you a little bit because you can't do it on live TV. As, as, as they reminded me a few times, I couldn't describe that play like I would in the dugout. <laughs> thank you, uh, Buck and Angela. Thank you both for uh, participating uh, today. Sandy, Billy, thank you as well. Appreciate everybody's participation. Happy holidays, and we look forward to seeing everybody and being in touch uh, very soon. Stay well. Thanks. All right, so that is Buck Showalter, his wife Angela at his side. He's going to join us, by the way, in just a couple of minutes. Gary Apple back alongside Andy Martino inside our SNY studios. One of the things that jumped out at me, Andy, was uh, Buck talking about the preparation mm -hmm. angle, and he's very open to analytics, despite the fact that many consider him to be an old-school manager. What did you make of that? Well, I think that sometimes these terms are thrown around pretty reductively and, and it gets oversimplified. What Showalter was describing doing with his wife Angela and A-Ball in the 80s, making charts and color coding with colored pencils, that's analytics without machine learning and AI and the kinds of things uh, that, that the cloud now makes, uh, uh, enables organizations to do in an exponentially uh, faster and more productive way. But I mean, our friend Bobby Valentine was doing these kinds of things with pen and paper in the 90s. Uh, people who have a rabid curiosity curiosity for the game, uh, have that curiosity for the game, will be interested in what information comes to them. Uh, the, the place that this will really be tested is inside a game. If uh, Buck is asked to do or suggested to do a particular thing that go against his beliefs on what he should be doing, that's not to me analytics versus old school. That's just what he wants versus what maybe someone else in the organization would want in the conversation that could ensue there. there. But I, I think this whole old school, new school analytics scouting thing always gets divided up unnecessarily. Let's welcome uh, Anthony Recker into the conversation right now. And Anthony, I'm interested to get your take on this because Buck said one of his main jobs is to give the players what they need as a former player what did you uh, what did you take out of that 
I loved it. Look, he, he talked about vulnerability, his vulnerability towards his players. Uh, you know, without using the word, it sounded like empathy, you know, putting himself in their position, trying to understand what they're going through, giving them, as he said, the best opportunity to succeed, uh, you know, in, in so many words. And realistically, that is exactly what the description of a manager is. And that is exactly what, as a player, you always want to hear. I am here for you to do everything I can to put you in position to succeed, to help this team win and to potentially set yourself up to, you know, afford, you know, a great life for yourself, your family, and those around you. And those are the types of things that um, speak to players and that we hear as players and really help us trust someone. Obviously vulnerability, a huge part of that building relationships is what being a manager is about and building those relationships with your players, building those bridges of trust and allowing yourselves to be allowing himself to be vulnerable gives the player the ability to feel like they can be vulnerable, speak in an open form, whatever it may be. I, I came away from this very impressed based on basically Buck's ability to kind of delineate and, and push you know aside his ego and anything else and just be a person first in that locker room that these guys are really going to appreciate. Uh, on that rack, I wrote down one thing Buck said, what's fair for one might not be fair for another one when he was asked about rules. And that's something that could apply to a management of people in any capacity with parenting. You have different curfews, maybe for different kids who have different routines or what have you. And he mentioned, hey, if a guy has more service time, maybe he doesn't have to get on that bus for the long ride across Florida in spring training. So that speaks to the point that, that you made, Rack, I think, about having some empathy and some understanding of the individual. Uh, Showalter has high expectations for people and can sometimes deliver them in a blunt way. No one would argue that. Uh, but what's an important uh, point of emphasis here, and I completely agree with what you picked up on there, Rack, is that he sees each player as an individual with individual needs. And I can say the names of current players. So in Baltimore, what, what might have been good for Manny Machado might have been something that was completely different for an Adam Jones or, or a Chris Davis or that great group that he had there with J.J. Hardy, who was one of his leaders. Buck knows how to look at these human beings differently each each from one for the next yeah and especially the fact that he brought up well, actually I think the question was brought up to him about accountability but he was you know very expressive in saying that accountability is going to be so part of this uh you know this organization and himself and this team all of his players they're going to hold themselves accountable and a way that he can you know basically I don't want to say um differentiate between players but when you talk to one player and, you know, uh, like you said, uh, parenting, uh, one kid has one uh, set bedtime, another kid has another set bedtime, whatever it is, um, holding yourself accountable for the decisions that you make. He also mentioned that somewhere else where when people come back to him or, or give him an idea, all he's going to say is, OK, what's your reason for that? You have one? Great. I'm, I'm with you. Let's learn about it. Let's figure it out. I like it. Tell me all about it. That is accountability. That's that's understanding and holding those around you accountable and then also holding yourself accountable for what's going on. And that is something that using he can definitely help to bridge gaps between players, management, the, the people around him on the analytics staff, his coaching staff. It's going to be really fun to watch this unfold. Well, you talk about the, the collaboration part of it, Anthony, and he said he's very much open to that and, and working with the front office. But uh, uh, Andy, I can't imagine that anybody's going to hand Buck Showalter a lineup card and say that's what we're going with. I would think the Buck and no no pun intended there is going to stop with him when it comes to making those sorts of decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And and to be fair to the Mets organization, I've known Sandy Alderson a long time and he's old school in that way too. He's never believed that it was the front office's responsibility to write the lineup card. Uh, I I don't think Showalter would be a guy to believe that. Uh, we. These kinds of things get maybe rightfully glossed over in any opening press conference isn't unique to today. Everyone's happy, everyone's collaborative, and these people are generally, genuinely, excuse me, excited to work together. But once the season gets going, of course, you're going to have disagreements about lineups, strategies, uh, defensive positioning, anything under the sun, and those 
those conversations can be productive within an organization. But when you bring in a Buck Showalter, uh, you know you're bringing in someone who's going to have strong opinions, who's going to have an openness to other people's information and opinions. But you didn't bring him in to be a shrinking violet. You brought him in for his knowledge and his gravitas and his sense of authority. So it's not as if he's going to be a guy who's told what to do. If they wanted that, they would have hired somebody 30 years younger and a lot less experienced. All right. Speaking of Buck Showalter, let's welcome him to the broadcast right now. He's uh, a flanked by his wife, Angela. Who was with him? Well, we will see him in just a matter of moments. There, there he is. is. Uh, Buck and Angela, Gary Apple inside our SNY studios. Good to have you with us. Andy Martino is here as well, along with Anthony Recker. Welcome, welcome to the Mets. I do want to begin, Buck, with something you said during your introduction right there was the fact that uh, you understand what this job is all about. That's to be the last team standing. Uh, I want to get your take on what you think is a common thread that weaves between uh, the lines and inside that clubhouse when it comes to winning baseball. Baseball teams. Uh, first of all, I, I love the shrinking violet. That was good. Shrinking <laughs> Thanks, violet. Buck. That was <laughs> mine. <laughs> Thank you. No, but uh, the common denominator to the last team standing, uh, obviously pitching. You know, be able to catch the baseball. You know, I think it was obvious very early on that Billy and I and Sandy shared a love for good defenders, and uh, I think things that make leads matter, whether it be a bullpen, whether it be defense. Um, I think uh, there's nothing that weighs on the morale of a team more than uh, when leads evaporate and, and uh, you can't hold on to things, especially late in the game, especially at home. There's so many emotional uh, challenges in a season. So you know, and I think another common denominator is that the front office and the, and the people down in the dugout and, and in the clubhouse are on the same page and they have a real respect for what everybody brings. You know, you know it's a real we – yeah, sometimes it's us against the world thing can work against you. You know, not everybody's your enemy, okay? And, you know, especially like dealing with media, it's not, a, it's not something you're going to win. I mean, you're not trying to win the battle. You're just trying to coexist and, and have respect for each other. And uh, it's, it's hard enough as it is without creating some problems that you could have stayed away from if you'd been more proactive. Buck, do you think it's different managing in New York than it is in, in other places? And, and if so, what are the challenges of managing in this town? Uh, yes and no. Okay, sometimes I think we think we have a corner on pressure, but there's just a – the thing I love is the sense of urgency in the day-to-day. -day. And from a managing standpoint, there's certain things that the, the fans and the, and the people take care of for you because, you know, uh, nothing exposes a phony – faster than, uh, than New York. I mean, it's, uh, if you've got a pure heart, you know, I, a long time ago, a great met, uh, David Cohn. I remember he was outside my locker. I mean, my uh, office in New York and he had had his third tough outing in a row, I think. And they're all around. And I remember David going, I told him this later at, uh, at the yes network. He said, well, you know, they asked him about booing him. And he said, well, you know, they're waiting to embrace me. It's up to me to give them something to embrace me about. And it really hit home with me that, you know, you control that. And it's not as long as you're fair and you're playing with effort and, and you care and, uh, you know, you care what your teammates think, you know, you control it. It's not something that uh, some uh, media outlet, but there, there's no place, you know, that will embrace you quicker if you bring what needs to be brought. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's certain things that are, I, I try to turn it into an advantage instead of a, thing that somebody uh, is worried about. Hey, Buck, it's Andy Martino. I, I haven't known hey, you as Andy. long as many of these other New York uh, reporters, but I think I can say confidently that you're not a shrinking violet. Uh, I had a... Uh, <laughs> I love that. Though. We got to hear that <laughs> intro, and that was great. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad you liked it. I had a baseball question. I'm going to audible it, and I'll ask you later if we have the time, but we've been watching Angela uh, sit next to you, certainly, for the past 70 minutes or so. Uh, you mentioned her a few times as a real collaborator, uh, going back to your time as a minor league manager. What has that partnership uh, been like for you in, in Certainly, you know, how, how has that partnership that you have with Angela helped you develop as a baseball person, as a manager? And, Angela, if you want to jump in and answer that, don't feel obligated, but feel free, of course. Well, I'll tell you this. Before I, she, you know, we got married in 83. We've been married 38 years, and um, it's a collaboration, okay, whether it be kids or travel or uh, where you live in another city. She's already making a lot of moves, but... Uh, Believe me, make no doubt about who runs this operation. She, she, uh, I bring in home those charts in 1984, 
five, six, all those years for her to fill out so we knew where guys were hitting the ball in the New York Penn League. I appreciate it. I don't know if I've ever properly thanked her. You have. <laughs> Go ahead, you answer. You know, I will say that the one part of it that I feel like that I can help is, you know, you do have these players all have families, whether it's their grandmother that's coming or their parents or aunts and uncles, their wives, their children, players having, uh, I, I feel like we now have four grandsons and I kind of was more up to speed on the baby, on all the baby gear because of being around baseball wives and having kids. And so there is that part, like when you get into the playoffs, how to navigate, you know, you have to, you know, the team, they get on their plane. You try to make that as smooth and as seamless for the for the for the families too, because you know if if the wife is struggling and has little kids, that impacts the player too. So that's the part that I always try to kind of talk to him a little bit and say, you know, because it's I have seen it change a lot of just the way the travel is and and you know and and it, it, these people all become your family, and so you you have to be like I said, very sensitive to making sure. You know that you know everybody's welcome and they're filling apart. You know somebody gets traded in the middle of the season; they don't know anyone. And, you know it's become easier today with the social media and the players' wives. But that's that's where I you know always want to help him because I don't want you know I've been there through a lot of different teams and traveling through the minor leagues, and so you know you just try to help make it easier. Yeah, you know, I, I tell the players all the time that. You know, the two toughest things you'll ever do in your life is be a good father and a good husband, and that's where your priority should always be. And I think uh, Angela and, uh, has helped everybody, and especially me, keep that in mind. Hey, Buck. Hey, Angela. Anthony Recker here. Uh, look, first of all, it's great to hear you both talk about family and family first. I think that's fantastic, and it's a great way to go about uh, you know, anyone's uh, priority list. But uh, getting back to the interview that you just had or, or the press conference you just had, you spoke about vulnerability. And in particular, you talked about basically forming bridges to the players um, in order to get the most out of them. How do you foster that environment? How do you create that environment so that every player feels vulnerable with you, you feel vulnerable with them, and there's an ability for you all to have uh, the capability to be empathetic and, and work towards one goal together? Now that's, that, that's, the, that's the million dollar question. You know, and everybody's got this magic answer that sounds well verbally, but uh, you know, I, it's like you just want to show through actions and every situation is different. It, there's not some blueprint for it. You know, you don't say, okay, here's some analytical blueprint on how you have a relationship with a player. You know, what might be different for X player, I can't even name names. This is really frustrating. But, you know, you, you, so and it's what do they want to be about? What do they need? And it's not about you. You know, if you bring your ego as a manager or a coach or something, you know, they, they might want to, your background as a coach, player, whatever, may get you in the door, but that's going to last a very short period of time. What are you going to bring? I just think that consistency of message, you know, if you say, this is how I want you to act and this is the culture we're going to have, you know, show me. You know, there's a fine line bet between being sympathetic and empathetic. I'm not much into sympathetic ears. You know, the cop comes out of uh, police academy. He's got all the right ways to treat people uh, from all walks of life. And then all of a sudden they stick him with some old veteran cops says, I don't listen to them. Let me, let me show you all the shortcuts. That's not good. We don't need the bad veteran cop. Uh, we, you know, if our people are, uh, they do, the weight of your words are very important, you know, uh, publicly and privately. And you need to understand that uh, what you do, your actions and your words reflect on your teammates, your fans and your organization. So, you know, if you got a problem with that, you're probably going to be in the wrong place. Buck and Angela, we know it's a, a very busy day for both of you. We want to say congratulations on the job and spending a few minutes with us. We look forward to working with you throughout the course of the year. Happy holidays to you and your family. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks you. for having us. All right, Buck Showalter, the new manager of the New York Mets. And one of the things, guys, that he spoke about right there, uh, he understands what it's like to manage uh, rec in this town. And, uh, Anthony, you've played uh, here and you've played in other places. And while in many ways it is the same, it is different. And uh, knowledge of that and having done it uh, across town, I think that will bode well for him. What do you think that brings to Buck Showalter? 
Yeah, look, uh, he has that experience of managing here and elsewhere. And the fact that he has both helps him understand, you know, what differences there are and the fact that in some ways it can be very similar. So I think what you're seeing uh, and what you're getting in a guy like Buck Showalter is someone who's obviously very well-rounded, been there, done that kind of a person, but willing and, you know, wanting to listen to those around him, to see what's going on, to read the room, to hear people out, and and to truly give them the time to not only affect what's going on in their life, but also what's going on with the team and how they do things. So what that, what that breeds is a successful, um, happy and a happy environment. It, bre- it breeds really a, a place where people can feel comfortable to be themselves and collectively come together and work towards one goal. So uh, I think what we're hearing and seeing from Buck Walter is a consistent message already and something that will be beneficial for these players as they get to know him and move forward through spring training and into the season. Yeah, I loved where your question brought him, Rec, about uh, empathy and the difference between empathy empathy and sympathy. That very interesting analogy about being an old grizzled police officer versus one who has empathy for people. That was cool. And to Gary, to your question about New York, I think specifically honing in, not just on dealing with New York fans, but specifically uh, coming up with the Yankees organization under George Steinbrenner and with Gene Michael. They mentioned, he had uh, Billy Epler, I believe, uh, mentioned Bill Livesey, who's another kind of vaunted Yankee scouting figure, along with Gene Michael, all the way up to Brian Cashman. I mean, these are people who are widely respected in the game, who Showalter, when he was younger, was able to be mentored and brought along by and worked with. And when you look at it, George Steinbrenner, I mean, this is an owner who in many ways is romanticized now, had many, many flaws and could be very difficult to work with. Also now works, uh, uh, Buck is now working for an owner with high expectations, uh, but there's no chance that Steve Cohen is going to be as angry or irrational as George Steinbrenner was at his worst. So he has great practice from that time with the Yankees at so many components of what's going to make him uh, successful here uh, as a high-profile Met. Well, one of the things that Buck Showalter said was that winning a World Series is not going to define his life. However, he does know that he's got a chance with this organization. There's money to be spent. There have been uh, huge moves made during the course of this offseason. We think there are more to come. What about the heightened expectations Rec and his ability to rise to that occasion. Yeah, it's great. And he talked about specifically eliminating excuses, uh, reasons that they they may not win games. Uh, you know, and he, he gave credit to the ownership, to to Billy Epler, to Sandy Alderson, to the entire front office that is, that is in place right now, to the fact that they've already gotten you know part way down that road, and they're going to continue to do it. Uh, it sounds like he was obviously given reassurances of that. And it's, it's something that as a manager, you obviously want to hear that this team is going to continue to do everything they can to give you a product out there that is going to help you win a, a world championship. And obviously, look, Buck says that's not going to define him. And I'm glad that's great. That shows, you know, the, the ability to drop that ego in some ways. But obviously, that is part of the job description here is to get the most out of these guys and to potentially get to that point and win a championship. And, and he knows that. He knows that is the job. And it sounds like from everything he said, he's excited about it. He's excited about learning new things, utilizing them, and trying to get to that next level with everyone around him. So, uh, again, hearing all the the best things, I think, from Buck Showalter. And and for me, you know, as someone who uh, I I had doubted whether he was the right choice or not, uh, he certainly won me over with this press conference. You know, what struck me about his answer to that championship question was about how, and anybody who loves what they do or is really deep in the life of what they do could relate to this, it's not about the end result for him. Uh, It's and this is what's going to lead him to success. It's about the life. It's about being in the moment. It's about being successful in that job day to day. Clearly, this is a man who, who lives for waking up every morning and being the manager of a major league baseball team. If you get to hoist a trophy and spray champagne at the end, that would be wonderful. But to shoot for that all the time is not the way there. The way there is to enjoy every day, every moment. Then you might find yourself in success. But once you get to that postseason and get in October, it's a lot of luck. It's a lot of things that are out of your control. It's hard to define success by that. So I I think Showalter there has the right perspective. It's just about being happy, loving that job day in and day out. And maybe that gets you where you want to be anyway. All right. So that is going to begin to wrap up our our special coverage here as the Mets introduce Buck Showalter as their new manager. By the way, on the way out the door, you can purchase Mets single 
uh, season memberships or single game tickets at Mets.com slash tickets. And our coverage continues later on on the television side here on SNY. Carton and Roberts, 4 o'clock, and then Baseball Night in New York at 6, and then Geico Sports Night beginning tonight at 11 o'clock. And so that is going to wrap up our special coverage here on our social media platforms uh, on SNY for Andy Martino and for Anthony Recker and for all of us here at SNY. I'm Gary Apple. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you down the road. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.